Psalm 82, we're going to begin reading verse number 1. <clears throat> the Bible says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Know they not, or they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said ye are gods, and all, of ye, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Now a few things we got to clear up here. Got to pave the road to get y'all where my mind's at, which I granted, it's a dangerous place to be but we all got to get on the same page. Okay, first things first. If you'll notice in verse number one, it says God, and because it's the beginning of a chapter, that's a really big G in my Bible, but it's a capital G. Then you look at the end of the verse, he judgeth among the gods, lowercase g. Okay, then again, down in verse number six, he says, I have said, ye are gods, lowercase g. But then, and all of you are children of the most high, capital H. Right? Referring to God. Now, keep in mind. Okay? Just like in English, there's a capital G, which means Jehovah. And then there's a lowercase g, which means a position, a title, a name. Right? Some deified person, but it not holy. Right? Not all powerful, not all known. That word in Hebrew was El Eliohim. Okay? That's what they referred to their judges as back in the day in Israel. And it actually makes a lot of sense. And if you study it out, and we're going to get into it, but verses 3 through 5, everything that he is, and by he I mean the Lord, everything that the Lord has to say to these individuals that he called lowercase g gods, those are the duties that God imparted unto the judges of Israel and charged them with these duties for the people of Israel. And the reason that these judges were associated with the, with the title of God is because they weren't supposed to be what they used to be. You didn't just make somebody a judge that Somebody you bumped into, hey, we need a new judge. You want to be a judge? No, they very strict qualifications. And you know what the qualifications were? You had to know what God said, because that's how you were supposed to judge. That's why they called them Eliohim, because they didn't make their own judgment. They judged as according to what God said. In fact, go back to the book of Judges. You'll find that before Israel ever had kings, God gave them judges and their duties were to judge as thus saith the Lord but in doing so they were also responsible for educating future generations of God's people on what God would accept and what God wouldn't accept what God said was right and what God said was wrong what God said was holy and just and righteous and then what was full of man and carnal and worldly they were the mouthpiece, so to speak, of what God accepted. But by the time we get to Psalms, chapter number 82, that has changed. No longer do judges judge as thus saith the Lord. We can find in verse number 2, How long will ye judge unjustly? Talking to those judges. And in context... God's asking this question to the judges. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Sailor, that means stop and have a think there. Go back and really ponder that for a minute. Now, no judge worth his salt and no judge that's going to stay in a position of authority would judge unrighteously, especially back in this day. If you were doing wrong, they'd kick you out. 
And depending on how wrong you were or how serious of a defense it was, they might kill you. Because you didn't judge as according to what thus saith the Lord. But he says, how long judge ye unjust? In other words, what he's saying is, how long is it going to take you to realize your judgment is no longer my judgment? Their standards had shifted. They thought they were doing right, but God says, how long are you going to keep doing wrong? How long will you judge according to what you think is best as opposed to what God thinks is best? Then the second part of the question, and accept persons of the wicked. What's wicked mean? They're not living up to God's standards. Now, granted, caveat, none of us can live up to God's standards. That's why Christ had to come. But hallelujah, through Him being robed in His righteousness, right through daily walking with Him, through daily confession of my and repentance of my own sins, Right? I can find favor in the eyes of God. But here, he's not talking about somebody that's endeavoring after God's approval. Here he's talking about people that among God's people have accepted that which God said we ought not receive, that we ought not entreat, that we ought not fellowship with. In other words, how long are you going to embrace the things that God told you you didn't need? If God said you need it, it's holy. It's righteous. It's good. If God said you didn't need it, it's going to be a stumbling block not only to your spirituality, but to those around you. Because of the actions of these judges. We, in verse number 3, he says, defend the poor and fatherless. What's that mean? They weren't defending the poor and the fatherless. The judges were supposed to be a beacon. A symbol to those that didn't have. They may have been born into poverty. But the judges could stand up and say, if you do what God says, God will bless you. God will increase you. Because God loves you. And God intends the best for you. The fatherless, those that didn't have a spiritual head of their household, the judges were supposed to point them to Jehovah. Say, you may not have a father, may have been born and father may have died in war. Father may have died from illness. Right? Mom's doing everything. Keep in mind, back in Bible days, if you didn't have a father, you didn't have a provider. Mom couldn't go out and get a job. Unless she was very fortunate. Most of the time she would serve in somebody else's house. But if she's doing that, who's raising the children? That very, very precarious position to find yourself in because the one that was intended to provide and to take care of you and protect you isn't on the scene. The judges were supposed to say, I know one that's better than any earthly father. That's your heavenly father. Do right, seek after him, and I promise you that you may not have a father as the world would think, but you've got a father a whole lot greater than any earthly father. But instead of defending the poor and the fatherless, he goes on to say, do justice to the afflicted and needy. People that have been afflicted are people that have been done wrong. The judges were no longer looking after those that were victims, that had had something taken from them, done to them. And then it says, goes on to say, ain't needy. Doesn't say the lazy. Doesn't say the bums. It says those that are in need. Doesn't mean that they're in want. It's not that they don't have something that they think that they should. No, these people have a need. And go and study it out. God instructed that He may have blessed you with an extra helping because He wants you to be the vessel by which He meets somebody else's need. God could have given it directly to them, but He wants to use people to affect other people. But here the judges are neglecting that duty. 
Then in verse number 4, delivered the poor and needy. First we find defend, then do justice, but here, deliver the poor and needy. Because they had not done as God had said, they didn't do right to those that needed someone to do right for them. Somebody to stand up and say, here's what God said on it, and that's what we're going to do. This is what we know is right, so we're going to do right. Instead of that, they judge as pleases them. Or they judge as pleases the masses. And as a result, those that are poor and needy, those that truly have a need, they go searching for it elsewhere. If the one that's supposed to help you doesn't help you, if under the current account, if the judge said that was that's it, right? No jury, no appeals court. That's it. Gavel hits the table. Done. You didn't have recourse to take it to somebody else, unless later on, like in the Roman Empire, Paul appealed what the Jews wanted to do. He says, "I'm a Roman citizen. You got to try me in Rome." So that's what they did. But even Agrippa, he said, if he had not appealed to Rome, I might have set him free here. But he said, but I can't do nothing. He's already appealed to Rome. Right? But under this time, if the judge said it, that's it. So if they were to cut off the mercies of God's people, if they were to cut off the kindness and the love of God's people, if they were to neglect their duties... What they were saying is there's no place for you among God's people. We're not concerned with you. So if you don't have a place with God's people, where do you go? To the wicked. To the world. To those that would lie to them. Mistreat them. Abuse them. Give, but take back. Or expect more in return. They delivered them into the hand of the wicked look at verse number 5 this is the indictment against the judges they know not who the poor and the needy the fatherless but those that cannot help themselves he says they know not neither will they understand in other words Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But how shall they hear without a preacher? They had the law of God. They didn't have it as readily available as we did, or we do. Not everybody had a copy. That's why it was entrusted to some, the scribes, to ensure that a correct copy would be preserved for all generations. And it was the job of some to take those preserved copies and read it teach and instill it in God's people one of those groups was the judges there he says those groups that you were entrusted with that you were given charge over that you were meant to be accountable for you've turned them away and how are they ever going to understand what God expects what God desires and what God wishes if those that have don't give to them. It says they will not understand. It says they walk in darkness. And colon. First part, he's talking about those that don't know about God. The things of God, the ways of God. But then, second half of verse number five, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. That's an indictment on God's people. It says they don't know any better. They fall into the hand of the wicked because that makes sense to them. They're blind. They can't see. He says, but the whole world, all the foundations are out of course. In other words, the whole world has forgotten what God desired, what God expects, what God wills. 
in the lives of those that follow after him. He didn't say that the wicked's foundations were out, of course. All. What's all mean? All. Then he goes on to verse number 7. Or verse number 6. He says, I have said ye are gods. In other words, I called you judges. You were supposed to judge in the likeness of me. You were supposed to judge as thus saith the Lord. But because of that title, notice, I mean, he goes on to say, and all of you are children of the Most High. He's talking about God's people, God's chosen people, Israel. He says, yeah, y'all came from Abraham. I chose you. Children of the Most High. And he says, and some among you I made judges. Gave them a position and entrusted them with my words so that they are told not only to the next generation, but to the heathen and to the wicked, to the false believer, to the hypocrite, to the doubter, to the apathetic. Everybody should know what God said. But then in verse number 8, he says, or 7, he says, But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. God called them judges, but they called themselves gods. They said, oh, we're kind of important around here. People care what we think. And because people care what we think, I don't want to rub people the wrong way. So slowly, things start shifting and drifting. And little by little, just like the ocean will pull a float slowly out to sea eventually you won't be able to see it anymore if you were on the float you won't be able to see the shore anymore they don't know how they got to where they are but they know uh, but God knows they're not where they're supposed to be they haven't even realized it yet that's why he asked him in verse number 2 how long shall you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked he says, I called you judges. You thought you were something more. He said, you stopped judging a long time ago and you started having opinions. You started, instead of giving out what God said, you started giving out your own personal preferences or you started giving out your own convictions but teaching them as doctrines. He says, you've given them more than what I said, but you've also given them less than what I said. And what's the payment? They thought they would live on as, you know, throughout history, great men, wise men, people that shaped the course of nations. But God says, nope, you should die like men. You called yourself gods, you're going to die like men. You're going to fall like one of the princes. Keep in mind, Song of Asaph. At this point, there are no more kings of Israel. There are no more princes. One of the princes, they used to live in nice big homes, had great estates, great orchards and vineyards. Everything that Solomon built, everything that he was blessed by God to know how to do that he did. By this point, everything that Solomon had done, most of it's turned over to dirt. Most of it's been toppled. Most of it doesn't exist anymore. They're saying, you're going to fall like one of them. You look around and say, look at everything that I've built. And God's saying, you're going to fall and it's going to come down with you. Then in verse number 8, this is the psalmist saying, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. The psalmist is pleading, Lord, how long will you suffer those that ought to know better to keep doing wickedly in your name? They turned the name of their position into the very name of God, but they weren't so presumptuous as to call themselves lords, right, or the mighty one, 
or the Heavenly Father, but they got as close to it as they could without crossing the line. They wanted to pe people to think that they were something. I find that in the book of Judges, those that God used most mightily as a judge were those that didn't think much of themselves but thought really highly of God. Not the other way around. So, as the psalmist wrote this to the judges in these verses, I see a lot of comparisons to children of God Christians. I mean, think about it. If you were to go in verse number 6, it's still God talking. He says, I have said ye are God's, or judges. And they were given that title so that they would judge as God would judge. Well, how did they know that? Because God gave the law to Moses and they were supposed to live according to the law. They weren't supposed to lean on their own understanding. They were supposed to embrace the understanding that God had given for them. Okay, well, we don't walk around calling ourselves God, but God did call us joint heirs with Christ. He, he's given us a position, a title. One that if we're honest, we don't deserve. But we didn't do anything to earn it, but God entrusted it to us. What is our position? Well, we're a joint heir with Christ. He made his kings and priests to rule and reign over this flesh and to enter directly into the throne room of God to offer our own prayers directly to God. We don't have to go through a man. We go through our mediary, which is the man Christ Jesus. Well, what else is our position? Well, they call us stewards. That means that he's entrusted his business unto us with the intent that we complete it. A master doesn't give a steward a job if he thinks that the steward won't do it. He gives the steward the job knowing that if he told the steward to do it, the steward's going to do it just as the master would have done it himself. He's made a steward. He's also made us ambassadors. We are citizens of a strange land, if you were to ask this world. One that doesn't make much sense. One that has ideals and convictions that rub against the mainstream of the world today. But being a citizen of that foreign land, I'm here as an ambassador to represent not only my country, but my king. What are our duties as a joint heir with Christ, as a son of God? There is, he said in these verses here, children of the Most High. We're supposed to dress like we're children of God. We're supposed to conduct ourselves like we're children of God. We're supposed to have conversation that becomes a child of God. All for the express purpose of verse number 5. They know not, but we know. Neither will they understand, but we understand, and we can explain. Then, they walk in darkness, but we have lamps under our feet and lights under our path. I know the one that is light, that is altogether lovely. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Then it says, all the foundations are out of course all the foundations were out of course because there was nobody out there standing on the rock. They were all standing on their own foundations. Didn't say that the foundations of heaven were out of course. God's ways were still as steady and stable as they had always been. But everything that man had built their life on, everything that God's own people had built upon, they are out of course. They've been shifted, not by God, but by man. What was the indictment of the Pharisees in Jesus' day? I mean, Peter got up and preached that the builders rejected the perfect stone, but the stone that they rejected, God said he was going to make it chief of the corner. He said, your understanding is going to build a faulty foundation. That's why God had to do it. And it's founded not on a crooked cornerstone, not on an uneven cornerstone no everything that God did started with Christ 
In fact, go all the way back. Okay, read Genesis 1, 1. Okay, in the beginning. Okay, then go read John 1. Starting in verse number 1. In the beginning, the Word was God, is with God. Without Him was nothing made. So literally, back in the beginning, the Word, Christ, which was made flesh and dwelt among us, Right? The word in the beginning, God said, let there be light. Jesus was the one that said it. Literally. From the alpha of time. And say, explain the alpha of time. I don't know, I haven't gotten there yet. When I understand that one, I'll let you know. But good luck if you want to try and figure it out. Because all I know is that in the beginning was the heaven and the earth. Where'd they come from? God put them there at some point. Right, well, when did he make all the... I don't know. But sometime long before he ever did all of that, they knew we're going to make man, man will fall, and we will become the propitiation for man's sin. From the beginning of the beginning, before there ever was a beginning, God was and Christ was the cornerstone. All built off of him. And finished by him. We understand those things. But if our life is out of order, why would anybody else believe that we know how to build a foundation upon our life? Really, we're not building a foundation. We're just moving everything that should have been onto Christ, onto Christ. It should have been on Christ in the first place, there where it should have been all along. Leaving the stuff that doesn't belong on the solid rock in the foundation of our life, leaving it back where we found it. But see, the question that will be the title of today's Sunday school lesson, verse number two, he says, How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked sailor? How long? As God's people, how long? How long are we going to sit around until we realize something needs to get done? Don't know about you. We can open that window. It's not just a dreary day. Life's getting pretty dreary. Day by day, things are getting further and further out of course. The foundations of this world, we know, will never be set back in order. That's why one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. This has been cursed by sin. Even when Christ comes back for a millennial reign, the curse is still there. Why do you think after the millennial reign, those that were born out of the 144,000 Jews, those that rise up against, why do you think they rise up against Christ? Because the Bible doesn't say that Jesus threw, the hell in, or threw Satan into hell or the lake of fire then. It said he bound him for a season. And then he was, look, sin was still there. Jesus just said, not now. This earth is still cursed. Will be cursed. But as a testament of who he is, he comes back to show that he's more powerful than sin, the devil, and everything else that's gone wrong in this world. We will have peace on earth. And we'll come back to rule and reign with him, by the way. But, one day, we're going to get new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. You can read a description of it. I don't think it really does it justice. Well, how do you know? because John was stuck using the words that I know in order to describe it. Now, I don't know all the words that God knows, and I don't know all the way that God would describe things. You know, Jesus came and started preaching about Jesus to everybody else, and it still blows our minds. Right? But, this world, foundations will never be set right. Why do you think he said, take my yoke upon you? For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Where he said, follow me. But then he also promised that he'd never leave us nor forsake. So we're following him, but he's also walking right next to us. Then, come to find out his word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He says, my way is proven. Just follow me and we'll make it all the way home. There's one foundation that'll work, and it's Him. 
But how long are we going to keep quiet? Verse number 5. They know not. Neither will they understand. You can throw a Bible at people as much as you want to, but unless somebody either gets a hold of God on the altars or the horns of the altar, really gets a burden for somebody, and the Holy Ghost starts working on that person's heart, or unless somebody sits down and takes the time to show them those things which they don't understand. Anybody, first time they ever sat down and read about it, anybody understand it all? No. You know why I know that? One, the word spiritually discerned. And unless God was dealing with you about getting saved, right? God wasn't sitting down and explaining the word of God to you before you saved. Not only that, the <laughs> Bible is revealed in tears. You have to get off of the sincere milk of the word of God before you can get to the meat. But then also, it's alive. The meat you ate yesterday, you can go back and find a different piece of meat in the same verse today. It's inexhaustible. It's a great resource. It's heavenly. It is holy. They are the words of God. He's exalted his own words above his own name. But, knowing that we have the greatest resource that man has ever had on how to live, how to conduct themselves, how to overcome everything in this world and everything that the world can throw at them, how long are we going to sit idle and not take it to those that need it? These judges, you know, used to bang on their own chest and say, we know what God said. Well, good for you. You telling the people that don't know what God said? Because that was their job. They were to judge openly and publicly so that those that didn't know or didn't understand would. And by not doing what God had intended them to do, they left those people to their own understanding. And they delivered them into the hand of the wicked. Notice, it didn't say that they were born delivered into the hand of the wicked. I truly believe God gives everyone a space of grace where He tries to deal with them. If you take the gospel to them, I believe, well, let me backtrack that. I believe if it's God's will for you to, at this time, in the way that He told you to do it, take the gospel to them, that He'll deal with them. You do anything outside of the will of God, God's not going to do anything with it. But if God told you to go to them, may not be the first time, may not be the second time, but eventually when their heart softens up, God will deal with them. The first time, it may intrigue them. They want to know some more. First time, they may dismiss it and say, well, I don't need that. But little by little, God will start working on them. They'll have questions. They'll come back and say, well, that wasn't what I was raised with, or this wasn't what I was taught. How come you do this? Because God said so. But we ought to be able, as those that know, be able to take them and show them, here's why God said so. Didn't say that they don't hear. Didn't say that they don't know what it says. It says that they understand not. There's no comprehension. There's two ways that you can learn something. The easy way or the hard way. But you can only learn things the easy way if there's somebody there to answer your questions. The hard way is experience. It's one thing for the teacher to sit down and explain to you everything that you need to know and then it's another thing to get into the textbook and read the eight chapters 14 times before it finally makes sense to you and finally understand what the teacher was telling you all wrong was correct. But knowing and understanding are two different things. It's very easy to understand. In fact, the Bible, I believe, is written on an eighth grade reading level. It's available in more languages than ever before. There's more Bible resources at your very fingertips today than there have ever been available to anybody else ever. But yet, fewer people understand it today 
than back in the day when they couldn't get a copy of it. Fewer people today truly understand that these are the very words of God and they're the only thing that can make a difference in somebody's life. They're holy. They're powerful. But yet we close it. We put it away. We hide it away in our hearts, but we never give it to those that need it the most. How long? How long are we going to pretend that nothing's wrong in the world? We just try to keep our heads down. Duck below the radar. Don't want anybody to point us out. Don't want to draw anybody's attention. Well, I find wherever the apostles went, they always drew attention. I find that when wherever Jesus, woman at the well, she knew he was a Jew. He never even told her. Why? The way he looked, the way he spoke, the way that he dressed. Because of who he was, she knew this guy's not, not from around here. In fact, she knew this is one of God's people. How many times have we had preachers come through here? Say somebody stopped them in the supermarket. You're a preacher, aren't you? How do they know that? Because they got God on them. But if you're trying to fly under the radar, what are you doing? You're delivering those around you into the hand of the wicked. The Bible says we're supposed to redeem the time. Buy back time. A little bit of grace, a little bit of mercy for those that know nothing about grace and mercy so that they can come to an understanding of Christ. But how long are we just going to pretend that it's somebody else will do it? It's okay. All I got to do is this. The judges were not accountable. They saw the poor and the needy and the fatherless, and they didn't defend them. They didn't do right by them. And ultimately, they were destroyed because of them. Don't know about you, but every now and then keeps me up at night thinking about all the people that their blood's going to be required at my hands when they stand before God. How many are there going to be? I don't know, but I guarantee you there's going to be more than I think. And here's the thing. It's already too late to change that for some of them. That eats away at me. But it also motivates me to do better tomorrow. The judges didn't go back and say, Lord, are you proud of what I did today? They were self-righteous and were proud in what they had done themselves. How long are we just going to try and duck anything controversial, anything that might upset people, anything that might cause people to look at us a little funny? I got news for you. There's somebody out there already looks at you funny. Most of the time, they're related to you. Okay? But somehow, the world is ingrained into God's children that if we speak up about something that's not politically correct, or if we bring out an idea that we know some people aren't going to agree with that, I don't care. God agrees with it. But how long are we going to sit back watching the world be delivered in the hands of the wicked and do nothing. Keep the status quo. The status quo is not working. Amen. Trust me, I wanted to get up today and talk about you know landmarks and celebrations and anniversaries and the 50th anniversary of the church today. Hallelujah. Amen. God's still growing. I mean, you can go back and see the old building. You want to know why there's a new building? Because some people just realize status quo is not good enough. We want to see God do something. We don't want to see man do something. We don't want to see what man's intellect can do, what the arm of flesh is able to accomplish, because it's going to fail us. But, like one sucker, they had a little bit of sense when they put Peter and John on trial after they healed the man in the temple. One fellow did say that if God be with them, no man can stop them. But if God isn't in it, it'll surely fail. That logic 
still exist in the world today. And the world looks at dead churches with miserable Christians, with people that are too busy tearing each other down rather than building each other up. And they don't look at those that may be the exception to the rule, but they look at that and they say, God's not with them because there's nothing to it. That's why the world needs to see some. You say, well, Brother Jordan, I'm not the smartest. I know that. Neither am I. But Brother Jordan, I'm not the most charismatic. Neither am I. I'm sarcastic and crass. I'm not very charismatic. But Brother Jordan, I may not be the best witness. God didn't call you to be the best witness. He called you to be a witness. But Brother Jordan, I just can't say things like they can say them. That's why God told you to go, because He wants them to hear it the way that you can say it. God didn't call you to be what you think you need to be. God called you to be who you are. He said, for lack of a better, we're going to paraphrase. I'm running out of time. But he said, with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, love God, serve Him, do the best you can, and then God said, I'll take care of the rest. Brother Jordan, I'm not the smartest. God is. And He told you to go. You saying that you're smarter than God, saying you don't need to go? You say, Brother Jordan, there's not much special about me. I know that. Not much special about me either. The only thing special about me is what God put in me. But, He didn't tell us to go and show Him us. No, see, this Word, it tells me. You know, it. I do when I get in here behold myself as in a glass as in a mirror and you know what I see not much worth looking at but you know what I find that really I'm just a big mirror either I'm reflecting all the things I've been looking at in the world all week or I could spend a little bit of time in here get a little bit of spiritual windex Right, grab some newspaper because we don't want streaks on it. We're not going to use paper towels. We're going to use newspaper so that there aren't any streaks on the mirror. We're going to get it without fingerprints, without spot, without blemish. And then we're going to do our best to put our face looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, like a flint face toward Jesus and then just point the mirror to whoever wants to come and have a look at him. You say, well, they were looking at me. No, you're just a mirror. They were looking at him. Well, there's a whole lot wrong with me. Well, there's a whole lot right with him. Just get out the way. Just say, it's not about... You're right. I used to be low down and filthy. And every now and then, I'm still low down. Every now and then, I still step in mud. But, but I tell you what, he never has. He'll never fail you. All those things... The world will give you excuses on why he can't. He's all the reason that we need on why we can, why we should, and how we can do it. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.